Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the, the Dataversity webinar today, which is Data Modeling and Relational to NoSQL, sponsored today by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. Excuse me. <laughs> For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions by Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To find the Q&A and the chat panels, you can click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat section to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to, to chat with everyone. As always, we, as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to our speaker for today, Matthew Groves. Matthew is the Product Marketing Manager at Couchbase and is a guy who loves to code. He has been coding professionally ever since he wrote Quick Basic Point of Sale app for his parents' pizza shop back in the 90s. And he's the author of AOP in .NET, publishing by Manning, a plural site author, the Microsoft MVP. And with that, I will turn the floor to Matthew to get the webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. I hope hope you're okay. I hope everything's all right. And yeah, of course. Uh, you no, know, I start choking right when I start. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, I uh, give you some time to take a quick break and make sure everything's okay. But uh, thank you very much, and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for attending. We're going to talk about JSON data modeling here, and we're going to focus a lot on uh, moving from a relational data model over to a more flexible JSON data model in a, that you might see in a document database like Couchbase, the company I work for. Uh, so this is, this is probably the view that most developers are familiar with when it comes to modeling data. Uh, but if you're looking, if you're interested in and you're looking at some of the non-relational databases such as Couchbase out there, uh, you, you have to start thinking a little differently about modeling. Now, fortunately, Couchbase does give us a lot of familiar tools and concepts that will map directly uh, from the relational world into Couchbase. Um, but ultimately we're going to want to take advantage of the unique capabilities of JSON and NoSQL and Couchbase and do some refactoring. So that's, that's the journey we're going to go on today. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about why NoSQL is important, why people are using it. We're going to talk about JSON data modeling in general, and then we're going to look into the to things that affect the way we model our data. And, and one of those is how we access data and then how we're actually, if, if we're going to move data from another uh, source, like a relational data source, how we might go about migrating that data. And then I've also got a demo for you today that shows some of the tools and some of these concepts in, uh, in process. So that'll be a live demo for you. So why NoSQL? Uh, because we've been using relational for a long time and SQL is a really great language to dealing with data, um, but there's some things that, uh, that relational doesn't really handle that well. It doesn't really handle change that well. Um, so changing of the schema, for instance, uh, both a logical and, and physical uh, type of schema, changing of hardware, changing of capacity. Um, and so NoSQL is designed to uh, help solve those problems, the problems of agility and scalability, performance and availability. I'm seeing uh, some great, uh, jokes here in the chat. Uh, three relational databases walked into a NoSQL bar. They left after five minutes because they couldn't find a table. Yeah, dump, dump. that's great. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's no tables uh, in a non-relational database, but as you're going to see, uh, tables do map uh, very neatly to some concepts that are new in Couchbase 7. So let's just talk about what NoSQL is first. NoSQL is such a broad umbrella term. I really don't like using it. I'd like to use something a little more specific um, and, you know, even the term itself, NoSQL, you know, databases that lack SQL, that's not even really uh, true anymore, as we're going to see today. But this is kind of a broad landscape with different types of NoSQL out there. Most uh, of the most popular NoSQL databases usually uh, are, have a multi-model approach. So it's more than one of these uh, different types of models. We're going to focus on document today. But as, as you see, as you're going to see, Couchbase can also support a relational style model, 
uh, text search model analytics and all kinds of other things. So it's really not as simple and straightforward as it used to be, but this is just kind of a little bit of the history. Uh, NoSQL was kind of called that because it didn't use SQL to access your data. It was, it was no SQL. Um, but of course that, that buzzword has lost a lot of its meaning and it's changed a lot. Um, but let's just think about document databases at the very simplest level here. Uh, just think of them as like a specialized key value store. And in fact, most document databases you can treat as a key value store as well. Uh, it's just the value is in a known format, typically JSON. So, you know, you're gonna write some code you start with a key, uh, a known key, and you ask the database to give you the document for that key. And you go in reverse when you're, when you're um, updating and uh, when deleting and things like that. So that's just kind of the really basic uh, intro to it. And there's a lot more built on these really simple key value stores that make document databases a lot more valuable as a general purpose database. We're going to talk about that as we go along. One of the reasons that NoSQL has taken off is uh, because of scalability. Uh, and so when I say scalability, I mean the ability for you to increase the resources of your database to deal with uh, more web traffic, more operations, more reads and writes, and larger amounts of data, and so on. And so one thing NoSQL does well uh, is called horizontal scaling, where instead of just uh, having a bigger machine with more processors, we just add additional machines to what's called a cluster. So as we need more capacity, we can add more uh, nodes to the cluster, that's what it's called. Uh, and we can keep doing that as long as we need to, to add more capacity. Uh, and we can just use um, all kinds of uh, uh, kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, relatively inexpensive machines is what I'm saying uh, to keep adding to this cluster. And we can actually scale down as well. If we don't need as much capacity, maybe in certain times of the year, certain times of the day, we can scale down that capacity. Commodity is what I was looking for. Commodity servers <laughs> to scale out. Uh, yes. Thank you, Bernie. Very good. Great minds think alike. Uh, another reason is flexibility. So uh, this allows you to easier, more easily manage change in business requirements and uh, more easily manage the change in the structure of data. And this can be very useful in lots of situations. So sometimes when you're pulling data together, integrating data from different sources, that flexibility really helps. You don't have to worry about if someone makes a small change, whether that's going to blow up the schema and blow up my import process. Uh, the document database means that you don't have a rigid schema that the database is going to force you to follow. Uh, so the developer gets more responsibility in that situation. Now, that being said, uh, what we're seeing here on the screen, this is not an ideal situation where we have documents that have both name. Uh, some of them are name and some of them are first name, last name. Uh, so we should still have some discipline about our data and, and come up with a plan in order to either handle the situation or to make the data more uniform. Availability is another one. This is a picture I took of my wife at a movie theater many years ago. Um, and I told her I was gonna put, put her in all my slide decks because she's demonstrating availability so well. And the idea here is if, if you have a cluster of databases, as we do, if one of those machines goes down, uh, the others will still be in place to take over the workload. And you can see in the movie theater here, one of the soda machines is down for maintenance of some sort, but we're still able to get soda from the other machines that are available in the lobby. Uh, so that's what we're talking about when it comes to availability. There's different levels of this. So if a whole data center goes down, we can be available in other data centers. Um, and if the internet goes down, we can be available on our mobile devices and so on. Performance is another one. Uh, latency and concurrency are typically talked about here. Uh, NoSQL can be optimized for certain access patterns. Couchbase specifically has a memory first architecture that makes it very, very fast, especially with those key value operations. I'm not gonna really go into a lot of uh, benchmarks here today. We, we have several on Couchbase if you wanna check those out against uh, competitors, uh, competitors in the cloud and, and so on. Use cases uh, are uh, increasing all the time. Use cases for NoSQL, uh, it's becoming more and more versatile and um, there's more features that allow it to handle use cases that it could in the past. So some of the more traditional ones are caching session, user profile for document databases, definitely catalog and content management and, and personalization are important. But over in the bottom right of the list, you'll see some interesting uh, use cases show up there as well. So uh, finance, uh, fraud monitoring, um, we're seeing uh, some of that, uh, some of the features of NoSQL, especially in, in Couchbase with ACID transactions, um, uh, allow all kinds of use cases to run on a NoSQL database. 
Um, so <clears throat> those are a lot of the use cases, but usually the catalyst is one of those earlier reasons. So performance, flexibility, scale, and so on. And just a quick quote here before we finish up this section is that uh, different isn't always better, but better is always different. So uh, with that in mind, we're gonna get on to actually modeling. Just a quick reminder here that uh, if you have questions, you can throw them there in the Q&A box there on Zoom and we'll get to those at the end or you can throw them in the chat and we'll try to uh, get there towards the end as well. So let's start talking about data modeling. Um, data stored is JSON. It's a little different than storing it in tables. So I wanna take, take us through an exercise in this. So let's just uh, look at a, a whiteboard exercise. Let's look at a customer data. We haven't even decided technology yet. We just wanna get it on to a whiteboard and, and have something to discuss. So uh, this you might do as a part of a proof of concept, for instance, I'd, I'd recommend a proof of concept when evaluating any technology, uh, including databases. Uh, but there's uh, four different things we see here. In here, we have a rich structure. So our customer here has attributes, potentially sub-attributes. So name is an attribute, uh, or if we had first name, last name, those would be kind of like sub-attributes. We have relationships to other data. So other customers via connections or, or maybe uh, to products via purchases. And we have a value evolution. So maybe we'd start with one purchase and add, uh, add more as, uh, whoops, and add more as Helen uh, continues to make purchases. We'd add those to the purchases collection there. And structure evolution is the last one. Maybe we start with just a single credit card number, but we want to uh, add multiple credit card options, multiple billing options for Helen. So we need to maybe evolve the structure to deal with that. And I'll talk about what I mean here um, at the next slide. Let's look at modeling customer data in a relational database. I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail because uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with this process. Um, but uh, we have all those things represented here in a relational database, a rich structure. Uh, you know, a customer has columns that uh, contain attributes or sub-attributes. We have relationships, so the customer can go through the connections table to other customers. We have value evolution. Uh, we can add more rows to the purchases table. And structure evolution is perhaps the, the trickiest one for relational data, the, the one with, uh, that's the least flexible option. So again, maybe we started with a credit card number column in the customer table. Not, not a great design, but maybe that starts out that way. And we get a requirement um, that we need to take multiple billing options. So now what we have to do is create a new table, migrate that data over, add a foreign key, uh, remove the columns from customer and, and a lot of work to change the schema. And that's for a relatively minor change. And if we have large amounts of data in our relational database, this could mean uh, downtime uh, or coming in at 2 a.m. on Saturday, which I know everyone loves to do uh, to make that schema change. Whereas as you're going to see, uh, the document database does not uh, have such requirements uh, to change data and change a uh, uh, change the flexibility of data. So let's uh, take a look here. Uh, we'll do a side by side. We got the relational model on the left hand side of the screen and the document model on the right hand side of the screen. Just sort of take you through this. Uh, this is a very simple uh, translation here. We go from uh, just a row of data in a table to a piece of JSON data in a document. Uh, notice the document key kind of corresponds to the primary key. And uh, the values just go into JSON values there. So relatively straightforward. If all our data was this easy, this would be a very, very easy transition. Um, now let's uh, add a purchases table into the mix. So we've got a customer and this customer has one or more purchases. And this is where we introduce a, prime, or a, sorry, a foreign key into the purchases table that points back to the customer that the purchase belongs to. So now we've got two pieces of data in two different tables. In the document model, we still have just the one document, but now I have a purchases array containing uh, those purchases, in this case, just the one. And so it's a single piece of data now, no need for a foreign key because the data is now domestic. And if we want to uh, value, do a value evolution, we just add another row to purchases and another item to the purchases array in the document. But again, we're still at one piece of data in the document database and three pieces of data in two tables in the relational model. So it's kind of like you're taking your data, your entity and putting it through a paper shredder and then you have to reassemble it every time you wanna access uh, that whole entity of customers and purchases. And there's lots of tools for this you may have heard of like uh, Hibernate or Entity Framework, ORMs they're called that uh, take all the shredded up data and put it back into entity form. But of course, with the document database, we don't need such mapping. We can just uh, serialize that, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, deserialize that directly to our in-memory object. 
So that's, uh, that's a benefit of storing documents like this as well. The structure evolution, uh, this is where, oh no, not structure evolution yet. We're talking about connections now. So we have a customer mapped to another customer, perhaps with some relationship information like brother or father. And we do this very similar to this in the document database. We have a connections array. And again, we don't need the foreign key because it's all domestic now, but this can point to a separate customer document. So for instance, XYZ987 points to another document for uh, Jane Smith's brother. And so that's what we're looking at here, just an array of a, another document key and any information about that relationship could be in there. All right, so let's put it all together in one big picture here. We have the customer contacts, purchases and connections tables. So we've got uh, seven pieces of seven rows of data in four different tables um, in the relational world. And we've got just a single document on the right in the non-relational document world. So uh, that is kind of the comparison there. Uh, now I mentioned the structure evolution. So we wanna add the uh, multiple billing options. So we have to go through and refactor our schema to do that. And that can be a very time consuming process. This example here is relatively simple. Um, uh, this is only five tables, but I'm sure many of you worked in schemas with many more tables and, and much more complex uh, schemas. And when you have to change those that can be very disruptive to production. On our document database, uh, all I have to do is, is start writing documents with the billing array in there instead. Um, so uh, one thing you might not have noticed here, this is kind of subtle, is that this is CBL 2016, the document there, document key on the top right. CBL 2015 is still in the database. So both these documents can exist in our database. So that's what I mean by flexibility. We can start making changes and just write the new model as we go. Now, of course, there is uh, some logic we have to deal with in terms of what do we do with the data that's in the older type of schema. And there's lots of options to deal with that in terms of uh, logic in the application that can deal with it uh, as you go or uh, migration tools that can, uh, that can do that as well. But the important thing here is that uh, to deploy this to production, we, don't, we have zero database downtime where we have to deploy a new application perhaps um, and maybe run some scripts, but we have zero downtime. This can all run um, uh, without having to come in at 2 a.m. on Saturday. So some of those approaches, uh, by the way, it, to versioning, I wanna go through those because I usually get asked about this, like how do you handle uh, data being in different formats? So the first is kind of a simple approach uh, based on version numbers. Um, both documents exist in the same database, but you can do different things in your code depending on the explicit version number. And the version can be more than just a number. Uh, maybe it corresponds to a .NET type or an assembly, however complicated you wanna make it. Uh, this is approach that you can't really take in a relational database because they both can't exist in a relational database. Second approach is like a big bang reversioning. Uh, this is just a, a big update command we can run or a series of batch updates uh, to change the data from one format to the other. We can kind of do this in relational, but it's multiple steps, changing schemas, again, possible, possible downtime. And then the third approach <clears throat> I like to call cooperative reversing. This is a little more complicated, but it's, uh, it's very cool if you can pull this off, is that a web application accesses a piece of data in the course of normal operations. But while we're at it, we can go ahead and change it to the new format. So as people log in, use the system, the data gets gradually reversioned to the new, mod to the new model. And so you can kind of take this approach with relational, but again, it gets messy because you end up with a kind of a, a middle state uh, where you might have a name, first name and last name column uh, in the process. You might have a lot of nulls in the process there. So those are some examples of different approaches you can take or a combination or uh, something else. Uh, actually, there is uh, a conference coming up, Couchbase Connect Conference, and there'll be at least one or two sessions on just the uh, versioning uh, of data, uh, uh, the migration of uh, of data to, hand, to handle the flexibility of JSON. So if you're interested in that, I'll have information for you at the end of today's session. Some modeling tools to help you along the way if you wanna take a more rigorous approach to this, uh, something like Hackalade supports uh, lots of NoSQL tools, including Couchbase. Irwin also supports Couchbase. Uh, those are those tools you may have in your enterprise already, or something as simple as JSONEditoronline.org. It's a, a, a no frills offering that can help you with modeling and diffing and things like that. Okay, so that's just kind of a crash course into JSON data modeling compared to relational data. Um, 
One thing that's important to point out though, is that the, the way your data is modeled is not just about a whiteboard exercise. It's also about how your application uh, is accessing the data. This can affect how you wanna model it. So with relational, you only really have one way to access data that's just SQL. It's the only way you can, you can access it. So someone commented earlier that NoSQL stands for not only SQL. And that's kind of a good point because with a NoSQL database, we have multiple ways to access data, including SQL. Um, I guess that's kind of ironic. We'll, we'll get to that. So just a, some examples of this uh, key value, as I mentioned earlier with the happy face uh, diagram. If you know the key already, it's a really simple and extremely fast way to access that piece of data. This is a C-sharp example here, but it's gonna be similar in other languages. So the first function is we have an ID and we're gonna get that uh, JSON document by ID and we're going to um, return it as a shopping cart object in C sharp. It's going to be um, serialized to that. Um, and then similarly, create shopping cart is we're just uh, saying collection.insert and giving it a new ID, in this case, a GUID and a shopping cart object. Notice I didn't have to write select or an insert, I'm just using the key value API directly. Uh, since key value is so fast and easy, it's going to benefit us to use it as much as possible. So if you can do this, uh, this is this is what I'd recommend. So uh, you can uh, some some guidelines to do this is is use a, a natural key, so a key that makes sense, um, uh, that is as semantic, that has some meaning to it. So for instance, it might be uh, an invoice number or uh, a driver's license number, something like that. Something that's that's really not going to change, and that it naturally fits uh, the piece of data that it's keyed to, and that also makes it human readable as well. So if we're browsing and see a bunch of GUIDs, that doesn't really help us too much. Um, I'm not saying you can't use GUIDs. You certainly can if you if you want to. But uh, if you uh, use natural keys, this is a good way to go about it and make them deterministic as well. And what do I mean by deterministic? So um, let's just uh, think about a, uh, a website that uh, is a blog, for instance, and has multiple authors. So I log in to the back end and I, my username is Matt. So just by giving the system that information, it can look up a document called author colon colon Matt. And from there, we can follow a trail of other documents. Uh, these documents would contain keys to other documents like uh, Matt's blogs. Um, or, you know, just implicitly we can say, well, I'm logged in as Matt. Matt wants to see his blogs. Well, let's find a document called author uh, colon Matt colon blogs. And maybe that would contain a list of things like C-sharp nine features. And that would be a blog slug, uh, for instance, we could look up and we can look up comments and so on. So we can walk through this chain of documents with only key value access. We haven't touched any sort of SQL query uh, just yet. So uh, if we're looking at uh, key value, this is a good strategy for just about any uh, NoSQL database that is used as, uh, has keys and, and JSON values. And so some rules of thumb that I wanna go through when you're modeling data, uh, this especially applies to the key value API. So if we have a relationship that's one-to-one -one or one-to-many, then it's probably a good idea to start with your related data as nested objects. So here we have Jane Smith and her purchases. They are nested. Uh, so they, they belong to Jane Smith and uh, that is a good strategy to take for that. If the relationship is many to one or many to many, for instance, uh, you can store data as separate documents. So instead of having those documents nested, we just have keys to those documents here in the connections array. And uh, another thing to look at is your data reads. Uh, if your reads are mostly gonna be the parent fields of that relationship, then again, it might make sense to store those as separate documents. Otherwise, we're going to be uh, getting Jane Smith's profile and all of her uh, connections and purchases and everything. And maybe we don't wanna transfer that much data over the wire. And if the reads are mostly parent and child together, for instance, a shopping cart for, uh, might be a good example. It would make sense to store this as nested objects. This means we can get them all with one lookup instead of multiple lookups. And I think you see where this is going. If we're, if we're doing writes that are mostly parent or child, not both, we can store them as separate documents. Again, because uh, we're going to be writing one or the other, in no sense passing them uh, the whole thing over the wire. And uh, finally, just to, Finished up for completeness if the rights are mostly parent and child together. So again, shopping cart, user profile, that sort of thing, store them as nested objects. So here's the screen I usually pause on when I'm in person, let people get their cell phones out and take a picture. Because this is kind of a good rule of thumb guide to modeling your data 
to, to best optimize for a key value lookup strategy. And this is not the only way we can access data in a document database, but it is a very fast and efficient way. So if you can go this route, go this route as much as possible. Now, since you're all at home, you can just hit the print screen button and get a screenshot of this. Okay, uh, one other thing to consider with key value lookup is something called sub document. So now we're getting into an area that can vary from database to database. Uh, can, you know, does the database support a sub document API? So if it does, then you have even more flexibility. Uh, some databases have them and call them something different. Some of them don't have it at all. So uh, make sure you uh, know that going in. I know Couchbase does for sure have uh, sub document access. But the idea is this, if I only need to access a uh, person's address or update their address, uh, then I can just identify that portion of the document that I wanna read and write. And then I can leave the rest on the server and just make changes or read that specific part. So this can be very helpful if you have a large documents doing a lot of reads and writes, you only need a small portion of data. If we just wanna flip one, one bit from true to false, for instance, there's no sense getting the, an entire large document, flipping a bit and then writing the whole document back. So that's something else to look for. All right, so we've been talking about key value access up until now. I wanna uh, start talking about other ways to access data as most NoSQL databases will have at least one way to access data besides key value. And so what does that have to do with modeling? Again, because modeling doesn't exist in a vacuum, you have to think about how you're gonna interact with your data. So here's some examples from Couchbase. Uh, just the three I wanna highlight there in green, the other two exist, but I'm not going to spend time on them today. Uh, so key value you see there goes directly to the documents, no overhead involved. In Couchbase, we have something called Nickel N1QL, which is a full SQL implementation. My favorite thing about Couchbase. Uh, and it, it, can, it really can't go directly to the documents. In some cases it can, but most of the time it's gonna have to go through indexes and a query parser and things like that. So there's some overhead involved there. Full text search is, I'm gonna talk about this very briefly today as well. Uh, it also has to go through indexes. Uh, Couchbase also has mobile capabilities and analytics uh, capabilities. Analytics stuff is very cool, actually. Uh, my favorite baseball team, who has uh, just got eliminated, actually, Cincinnati Reds, are using uh, analytics at uh, their organization. Um, and Domino's Pizza, also using analytics. Uh, these are things you can learn more about at the Connect conference that's coming up. So uh, anyway, into the query language. So Couchbase is nickel. N1QL, it's a, it's powerful. Uh, it's very flexible. It's declarative nature, and it's very familiar to developers because developers are used to joins and selects and CTEs and subqueries and all those kinds of things. Um, but uh, so, just for example, if we if we don't have, uh, you know, if we if we want to look up um, users that have either a Visa or Mastercard as a payment type, we really can't do that via key value lookup. So we need uh, some sort of query to uh, look at the secondary values of the JSON data. So that's what's happening here. We're saying, give us all the users who have a card type of Visa or MasterCard. And so once we step out of key value access, we have to involve other processes. So parsing the query, uh, most likely using indexes. And in the end, it's going to use the key value lookup anyway, uh, again, behind the scenes to get that data. So there's some overhead involved, but sometimes it's necessary. Uh, in order to get to have a flexible query that gets you the information you want. And it's important uh, to dive into these queries and understand how they work and uh, to better optimize them, just like it is in the relational world. Um, so as an example, here's a Couchbase SQL query. I executed this one and I think it ran in 1.2 seconds, just to put a benchmark down there. It's using an index on the type field. Um, but notice the line four, it's also looking at the name field. So I can bring up a visualization of this query plan in Couchbase to see which parts of the query are taking up the most time. Uh, so we can see here, it looks like the uh, fetch statement is, is taking the most time, 187 fetches. And unfortunately, uh, it's only, it's filtering out most of those in the next step in the filter. So that may, may be an area of waste that we wanna look at in our query, if that's slowing us down. So in Couchbase, there's actually also an index advisor. So you can execute a query and say, uh, give me some advice on this query, and it'll tell you what indexes it's using right now and what indexes it recommends that you use to speed up the query, make it more efficient. So uh, there's a recommendation there. I went ahead and uh, created that query, and the same query went to 146 milliseconds. 
So that's about eight times faster uh, than uh, we started with. So that's good. And if we wanted to eliminate that fetch step, then what we can do is see this uh, line one. Most of you who are familiar with SQL are probably cringing at that anyway, where we're selecting star. Uh, if we select just the fields that we need, for instance, maybe just uh, uh, one or two fields, we can actually index those fields and then skip the whole fetch step, get the data right from the index. So we can speed it up even more. Uh, okay, so that's uh, SQL. A full text search is also available in Couchbase. And this, is, this revolves around text, yes, as you might guess from the name, um, but also some things uh, that you may not guess from the name. So it can also do some geospatial searching. So you can search by, say, a, a radius around a location, latitude and longitude. Um, you can also do, um, uh, actually, full text search uses a different kind of index than SQL. It uses uh, something called inverted indexes, whereas uh, the SQL language uses a, a modified B tree. So anyway, some things like stemming, uh, language awareness, facets, uh, ranking um, can all be used here, used here uh, from full text search. But in the end, the results are all ranked uh, and they're all language aware. So I just searched for the word submarine and I got this as my results. You can see it's highlighted there, the search results. And it's determined that that first result is more relevant than the second result. So this is something I could use instead of that like uh, keyword, for instance, if I'm doing text-based searches. All right, so here's another cell phone screen for you. Uh, if you're looking at a, a NoSQL database, this is kind of the... The, the, the three steps I'd go through is if I'm trying to figure out uh, how best to access data, I'd start with key value. If I can do that, uh, then that's where I'd go. Uh, then if I'm doing something with text, I would look into full text search instead of a like, or um, this is kind of a weird edge case, but if there's a large amount of disjuncts, I might use this engine as well. And finally, uh, nickel or SQL is going to provide the most flexibility. Uh, so it can query pretty much everything else, but you must have good index in there. So make sure you're checking out your indexes um, and optimizing those the best you can. Okay, uh, so speaking of optimization, we're gonna get into that a little bit today. We're gonna go through an example uh, of migrating data over. Um, and I say migrating, but you know it can also mean synchronization. We're not necessarily throwing out a relational database or at least not right away throwing it out. Um, so we often have to sync them. So either one of those processes, think of it as migrating or synchronization. So there are a lot of options uh, to migrate. And one thing that Couchbase 7 has done, uh, the most recent release of Couchbase is enabled uh, number five and number four on this list. So oftentimes you'll, you'll see like, we need a new database. So we have to rewrite the whole application all, the, all over again to take advantage of that database. And that's a high effort, high risk, potentially expensive thing to do. Not always a bad thing because you get to take full advantage of the capabilities. But it might be nice if we could just start with the data as it is, as it is in relational database and just host it in a NoSQL database uh, with as few changes as possible and just see how that works. And since Couchbase has SQL, it has joins, it has asset transactions, that's actually possible uh, right now. Uh, and then we can optimize later. And I'm gonna show you that in this demo here. We can take a look at our model and, and combine and nest those objects when it makes sense to. And that's going to uh, improve our data access and our, uh, with some data modeling changes to meet our performance goals. So anyway, uh, some of the tools you can use to do this kind of migration, there's a lot of them. Um, some of these you may have heard of, may have at your organization already, some of them you haven't heard of. A couple I want to point out is a glue sync there. That's a commercially supported tool that supports uh, real-time synchronization between relational databases, uh, such as SQL Server and Oracle, over to Couchbase, which is a very cool uh, uh, tool to throw in there if you want to, if you need to sync or you want to start migrating away. Um, another one I want to point out is Apache NiFi. It's a very cool open source project. I don't know if you've I feel like it's not getting a, a, as much attention as it should, but it's a, a, a UI that allows you to visualize the data flow in your enterprise, uh, set up uh, processes to uh, stream data around different databases and different data sources in real time. Very cool. There's lots of other tools available there as well. Uh, you can also <clears throat> try to build your own, which is kind of what I've done, uh, is... Uh, use some uh, coding uh, or some scripting to, to build your own kind of uh, migration or syncing process. 
So it can, it can be as simple as a command line uh, tool, a CB import, it comes with Couchbase that can import uh, CSV or JSON data right into Couchbase. Uh, SQL Server has SSIS, Oracle has Golden Gate, and there's lots of other command line tools, uh, Python, PowerShell, Bash, those sorts of things. They can take advantage of REST APIs as well. But here's kind of how I think of the process. And back to that uh, one through five, those five different levels, this is kind of like the level five approach. This is the uh, keep it uh, really simple approach, the KISS approach, if you will. And so this, you can start with this approach and just treat the NoSQL database as if it were a relational database. Don't do any modeling or any remodeling, just import the data as it is, query it the same way with SQL, you know, as many joins as you need and have lots of that shredded data, those pieces of uh, shredded paper, have them everywhere in your data. And now once you've got that in place, you can then start to transform the data usually using those modeling techniques that we've discussed to improve performance, reduce the need for joins, and possibly even reduce the need for querying. You can go back to the, the key value API. And maybe you just wanna start with this one, uh, like one root entity at a time. Maybe you start with the, uh, the user profile model and then go from there. You know, start, start where it hurts the most. Where, what part of your application is the slowest and, and needs uh, refactoring? That's where I'd start with, with uh, this kind of remodeling. And then we're gonna get to the level four and then possibly even level three and two at this point when we transform this data as we import it into like a staging area and we transform it into a more optimized form of data. So just as a really simple way to do this, we could do export from relational to CSV, import from CSV into a staging bucket, have some nickel scripts to transform that data into the optimized uh, bucket and insert that results of that transformation into that new bucket. So that's the really simple a type of process that you could go through. And it can get more complex than that. Uh, you can, of course, use more complex tooling if you want to. And then I think uh, the last thing in terms of your migrating your application over, we, we need to think about aligning your data model, your migration approach and your expectations uh, to uh, what you're actually doing in the database. Uh, so if you don't model your data to take advantage of JSON and NoSQL, you're, you're probably not gonna realize the full benefit right away. Uh, so it's, it's, it's fine for a proof of concept, but ultimately you have to start optimizing that model. With that in mind, I want to uh, show you something that I've been working on. This is a, a build your own, although it's open source, anyone can use it if you want to. Um, but this is something I've been working on for uh, initially level five, and then I started to make it into a level four approach. And this is a tool that I've written called SQL Server to Couchbase. So let's start with, uh, hopefully you can see my screen here still. This is a SQL Server Management Studio and I've got AdventureWorks database loaded up here, which is a popular uh, SQL Server sample. And uh, it contains a lot of data about, a, I think it's a bicycle shop is what it is. But you can see here, we've got uh, all these tables here and each table uh, lives in a schema like human resources or person or production. And then each of those uh, tables has its own name. So address table lives in the person schema, address type lives in the person schema and so on. Now, uh, what I can do with Couchbase is, uh, and I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna show you this process, but uh, what I've got over here in Couchbase is I've got a, what's called a bucket. And so a bucket is kind of analogous to a SQL Server catalog or, or a database. And so you can see it has uh, 760,000 items in it, which is what's in AdventureWorks as well. And I've, my, my code, my process has copied this data over as is. So it's not done any remodeling. Uh, it's just lifted and shifted that data from tables over to Couchbase. So if we dig into the scopes and collections in Couchbase, uh, instead of a schema, we have something called a scope, but it's a very similar uh, organizational concept. So you can see I have a person scope, I have a human resources scope and so on, even a default scope that, that will match like the DBO scope in, in SQL Server. And then inside of each of these scopes, there are collections. So these correspond roughly to the uh, SQL Server tables. So you can see I have a person collection inside the person scope. Uh, email address collection inside the person scope. And those correspond to the email address table and so on. So I wanna show, uh, let's go over it's back to SQL Server here and I'm going to query some data out of the address table. 
So this is just getting, I don't know, a thousand records out of here. And you can see each row, it represents an address with uh, a city, a state, a zip code, uh, a geography, location, a GUID, and a modified date. All right. Now I have a, a program that, that runs and copies this data over. Uh, and if we look at person address, person scope address collection in Couchbase, click on documents, and this will roughly correspond. Each document will correspond to a row of data in the relational database. But it is JSON though. So if I edit one of these, you can see it is JSON data instead of a, a row of data. And the data pretty much looks the same. Uh, you know, we've got, uh, it's JSON data types instead of SQL Server relation, relation types, uh, sorry, SQL Server relational data types. And something like uh, the geography location in SQL Server is broken down into a, uh, a JSON, a nested JSON object. So latitude and longitude, which would be perfect by the way, for a, a full text search from doing like a geographical radius search, for instance. But anyway, all the data is still there. It's just moved into JSON data format in Couchbase. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through this program. We don't have time to go through this as much as I'd love to. And I'd love to get uh, any of your thoughts or comments on this. So I'll give you a GitHub link uh, when we get back to the slides where you can check out this code, run it for yourself, uh, make suggestions, criticisms. I would absolutely love to get your feedback on this tool, especially if you're looking to go through this process yourself. You know, I'm creating this library to, to help developers uh, move their data from relational to Couchbase for whatever purpose. If it's a proof of concept, if it's for fun, if it's for you know serious research, any of those reasons, uh, I would love for you to, to check out this tool and try it. So what I've got here, if you look on the right, uh, I've got a SQL Server to Couchbase project. So that's a .NET library that you can uh, bring in and use in whatever you know, console application you want to or web service, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then I've got a console example that uses the AdventureWorks data set. And I'm just giving it this uh, configuration file here. I'm selling, here's how you connect to SQL Server, the connection string for that, that's my local host. And here's how you connect to Couchbase. So again, local host and uh, some uh, credentials, some other defaults. And uh, so there's some other settings here we're not gonna get into, but this is basically going to start looking at SQL Server and saying, okay, I see a human resources department table. I need to create a human resources scope if it doesn't exist. I need to create a department collection if it doesn't exist. And then I need to go through each row of data and make that into a JSON document in Couchbase. So it's going to do this all for you. Uh, you don't have to create the structures yourself by hand. It'll just do them, it'll create them automatically. It, by the way, it also, I'm not gonna go into this much either. It also is going to look at your SQL Server indexes and creates versions of those inside of Couchbase. Because again, Couchbase uses SQL query language, so it can also create indexes in a very similar way, as you can see here. It's also going to create uh, users, and we're not gonna get into that very much, getting a little sidetracked here. Okay, um, one other thing that it can do. So at this point, we're basically at level five. We're copying the data and structure right from SQL Server and dropping it right in Couchbase as is. Now, in the long run, as I said, you might want to consider refactoring at least some of that data to take advantage of, of JSON and, and nesting it when it makes sense to. So that requires some, some human thought to do that. That's something that's really hard to automate. But once you've figured out that, hey, I want to collapse these tables into a single document, uh, well, then this program gives you the ability to just specify that in a declarative way. So uh, this is called denormalized maps, and we're gonna skip the one-to-one, -one, not terribly interesting. Well, let's say we have a many to one relationship here. We have a person phone table and a person table. And basically AdventureWorks is telling us that a person can have more than one phone number, right? So the way this is represented is we have a person person and we have a person phone number table right here. So two different tables uh, and it's joined together by a foreign key every time we need to combine those pieces of data together. So if we want to optimize that towards a NoSQL model, we can just specify here that I want to, this is gonna be the from, move the person phone number, move the data from person phone number to the person uh, document. And this is the foreign key uh, to do it with. So I've actually done this already. Again, I don't wanna let you sit around and watch my uh, script run. 
this is not terribly exciting, but I'm gonna show you the end results here. If we drill into the person documents and edit this document, you can see that the uh, rows two through 14 there are the original data from the row of, uh, the row of data in the person table. And then lines 15 through 25 are the phone numbers that have been embedded into this document um, by just by nesting this data. And then I've also done the same thing with email addresses. I'm nesting those as well. Notice that it's an array. So line 15 uh, through 25, that's an array. So if this person had more than one phone number, it would be listed here as an array. And what we've done here is we've combined a person, their phone numbers and their email addresses into one single document. So if I want all the information to show to a user, perhaps, hey, you can edit your information, keep it updated. I can get all of this data by key. The key happens to be just one here. I can do a single operation to get this document by key, present it to the user and allow them to make changes to it and by writing it with just one key. So I'm avoiding SQL here. I'm avoiding the need for joins or asset transactions um, and speeding up my, uh, my uh, applications and taking pressure off of my SQL, uh, of my query engines and uh, taking pressure off of the overhead that's involved with asset transactions. Although I do wanna reiterate, this is something you should do, but if you can't do this just yet, you can definitely still use SQL joins and ACID transactions in Couchbase. So that's something that Couchbase has had joins for a long time and has introduced ACID transactions uh, just recently. So that's, uh, that's the process in a nutshell. Uh, we've seen level five and level four migrations from relational over to Couchbase. So I'm going to take us back over here to the slides, finish up, and we'll have a few minutes for questions, I think. And it looks like there's a lot of them. So uh, interested to see what we've got. Uh, hopefully, uh, Shannon has recovered okay. We're just about ready to, to wrap up here. So they say you only remember three or four things from any given presentation. And so here they are. Uh, one is I want you to pick the right application. I want you to focus on uh, an application or part of an application, like a microservice, for instance, that uh, would be uh, aided by NoSQL. So do you need flexibility, higher scale, uh, better performance, uh, lower costs even, or flexibility, then that's the right place to go uh, to, to try uh, NoSQL. And before you just dive right in, I'd recommend doing a proof of concept. You know, go through the modeling exercises, uh, come up with a, a focus on a very specific area and success criteria to know, uh, you know, what is it we want to accomplish and have we accomplished that yet? And you can use this opportunity to review the architecture and say, okay, well, here's what we've learned by going through this process that we can apply when we go through and do the full uh, refactoring or, or full changeover to Couchbase. And you can use tools like Hackalade or Irwin to help define those, especially with a larger team. And you can feel free to use the tool that I, I'm, I've open sourced there on GitHub uh, uh, to, to do this as well. Uh, always match the data access to the requirements. Remember SQL, uh, relational world, you can only use SQL. With uh, Couchbase, you can use key value, full text search, SQL, and some others that I didn't even cover today. Uh, so use the one that's the right fit for the best performance. Next steps for you, I would love it if you downloaded Couchbase 7. Uh, we just released it recently uh, to GA. Uh, the Enterprise Edition is free for you to download and try out, um, and it's great for your larger applications. We also have a free Community Edition that's fine for the smaller applications. We have a free conference coming up, completely online conference, completely free, uh, diving into a lot more detail, some of the things I've touched on today, connect.couchbase.com. I highly recommend you check that out. And then finally, if you wanna check out this tool, if you're interested in this tool or, or you're going through something similar, I would love for you to try it or at least leave some feedback, criticism, suggestions, whatever you'd like. Some of the coolest things I've built into this tool have come from the community making suggestions or asking questions. So even if you just have time to throw a two sentence comment up there on GitHub, that's very much appreciated. So you can check that out, GitHub, mgroves, and it's SQL Server to Couchbase. Right now I'm in the middle of a refactor that will allow it to work with uh, databases other than SQL Server. So maybe Oracle, for instance, or Postgres, but for right now it's just SQL Server. Okay, I think we have about uh, I've exhausted all the slides. I'm, I'm open for questions now, if Shannon is uh, available. 
I am, and I did not risk in taking a drink of water, which usually clears my throat, but was not so successful earlier. <laughs> um, lots of great questions coming in. If you have questions for Matthew, please feel free to put them in the Q&A portion of your screen. So diving in here, um, can we build logical models on top of NoSQL data models? Can we build logical models? Um, I'm not sure what exactly you mean by, I think I need some more information there, what you mean by logical models. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say just in generally speaking, you know, document databases, the, like the ones I've shown you today are in the NoSQL world, probably the best general purpose database. Uh, so if it's something you could do in a relational, uh, with relational data, you could do the same thing with, uh, with the non-relational, with JSON data. I like it. And NoSQL models are only suited for product data model? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say, like I, like I mentioned in the, in the uh, slides, there's lots of different use cases. Um, I just happen to use, uh, I think, the AdventureWorks because it's, uh, it's, a, bi it's a bicycle shop. Um, and I, I use that in my examples because I think everyone can relate to, you know, going to a, a website and purchasing things and seeing their history and uh, seeing the catalog and things like that. But uh, yeah, there's lots of different use cases for NoSQL out there. Indeed. So Matthew, one big difference between document and relational in your customer example, you have read the whole document to update at a customer connection, then write back the document, slower for a heavy OLTP application, but fast for a system needing everything about a customer. Is that correct? Yeah, right. And so, so Robert uh, had a follow up here because I think he asked this question before he saw the sub document uh, line there is, yeah, yeah, certainly for OLTP, you want to, you know, uh, model it in a, in a way that would reduce the total size of the documents. Um, or you can use a sub document, as he mentioned there as well, to just get a, a small portion of the document. And, and finally, since we have SQL available, you can, you can use a select to just identify the few fields you want. Uh, you don't have to return everything from those documents. So, so yeah, I think Robert's kind of answered his own question there, but, but yes, absolutely, that makes sense. Well, right, oh, yeah, I'm still here, sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, well, NoSQL provides a lot of flexibility. Do we have tools available that ensure data quality natively in the database, like in the relational world, things like allowed values, referential integrity, and things like that, or does this need, uh, need to be addressed at the application level? Yeah, a, a very common question I, I, I see a lot. Um, the, the answer is that there are some NoSQL databases that provide uh, some tooling for that. Um, it's not quite the same as referential integrity. Um, that's referential integrity is one of the things that makes uh, the scaling so difficult. And one of the things that NoSQL was invented to kind of work around in the first place. Um, so definitely the application level, you can, you can address it there. That, that being said, there are some things in the NoSQL world that are coming along. Uh, Couchbase has something called the eventing service that allows you to write some logic uh, on the server side to respond to uh, data events like data being created or updated or deleted that uh, potentially uh, could be used to accomplish the same sort of thing uh, and and or might be actually uh, in the future being used as a basis for a, a server side validation uh, is, is the best way I would I would describe it as not not so much the referential integrity uh, sort of things that you need more in a relational database because your data is split up into those shreds. Yeah, and the questioner added a comment as you were giving the answer, something like a trigger. Oh, yeah, so uh, something like a trigger. So in Couchbase, specifically the eventing uh, service, it's not, I wouldn't call them triggers because there's there's some differences, but yeah, it can respond to data change events with custom code that you're writing um, uh, on, and that, that can live uh, on the database uh, cluster itself, not, not in the client code. So is a NoSQL database not suited for creating a data warehouse model? So one thing I didn't cover today is Couchbase Analytics. Um, that is something that um, can be used uh, for something like a data warehouse. I, I think it's probably closer to, uh, there's kind of a spectrum between operational and completely analytic data warehouse type of um, operations. And I think Couchbase Analytics lives at a, at a good place right in the middle of those where it can uh, execute complicated queries on your data without impacting uh, performance of your relational data. 
It can also, uh, we started adding some features that allows it to query from Azure blobs and uh, Amazon S3 stores. So you can combine different sources of data and query them all with SQL. Uh, and this is SQL that's made for flexible JSON data. So it's really SQL plus plus. It's SQL plus some more uh, functionality to deal with JSON. So uh, I think we're getting there. I wouldn't say it's not suited, um, but I certainly think uh, there's lots of things you can do with analytics um, uh, that uh, you, you might uh, have relied on tradi traditional data warehouse for in the past. So how would you handle metadata, document definitions and attribute definitions, the stuff um, that would be in a relational catalog if the DDL was generated with the comments? Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've gotten this question before. Um, cer certainly, uh, you know, the way I did it with my uh, tool was to just, just go ahead and create them, right? But one thing I, I get, and maybe this is something I should, you should go ahead and create an issue for in my, my uh, GitHub repository is uh, don't actually do the work, but create some scripts that would do the work. And, and that might be something that, you know, we could put comments in there in the same way that we do with uh, with DDLs. Um, so that actually might be a very good suggestion um, for that. But uh, in terms of them living in the database, um, there there is actually, I don't know if it's really meant for this, but if you look at uh, a document, there is a metadata field here and you can put metadata uh, on each document. Now, it's not really recommended that you do this unless you have a, like a framework specific reason to, but it is possible uh, to store metadata there at the document level if you if you want to. I love it. I love these questions. <laughs> I love it when, they, when it's something new. Um, <clears throat> that's great. All, all teams use analytics in the uh, MLB, probably too much <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> oh gosh. So someone must not like the shift, I guess. But uh, so this, the Cincinnati Reds actually, they use Couchbase analytics, not for on-field analytics, but uh, for marketing analytics, uh, I believe. Uh, so it's, it's things like, uh, uh, you know, offering, uh, you know, promotions and coupons to, uh, to ticket holders and buyers. That's, that's what the Reds are using it for. So yeah, uh, don't get me started about the Reds uh, or baseball. I'll talk about it uh, all day. <laughs> I'm with you there. <laughs> so is there a compression in Couchbase? Uh, I believe, I believe there is compression in Couchbase. Uh, let me just uh, double check here. I think it's actually an adv advanced setting. Yes. Yeah, so we have different compression modes here. You can just turn it off if you want to, and you have passive and active, which have different performance implications. But yeah, that's just a, a, a checkbox basically for, for compression. Okay, are, you, are we still there, Shannon? Is everything still good? I'm still good. I'm just talking to the mute button. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> lots of good questions coming in. I think we have time to slip in one more here. Okay. Um, and uh, any questions we don't have a chance to get to, I'll make sure and get over to Matthew and Couchbase so y'all can um, keep those coming in. Uh, in an environment using messaging like Kafka, does Couchbase have a facility to get put in uh, Avro? Okay, so I know Couchbase has a Kafka connector available. So you use Kafka as both a source and a sync. Um, I, I'm not well versed enough in Kafka to know if it's if it's Avro specifically. I do know I mentioned Apache NiFi earlier today that the Couchbase plugin, which is not it's a community plugin, it's not supported. Uh, I think uh, either supports Avro or NiFi can do the Avro conversion there. Um, so really, the answer is I don't know. But uh, look at the uh, Couchbase Kafka connector documentation, and that will probably give you the answer you want. Perfect, and I think that leaves us time even for one more. Um, okay. Can you talk a bit about Couchbase and asset transactions? Can Couchbase be deployed across multiple Azure clouds like DataStacks? If so, how is asset employed? Okay, yeah, I can talk about asset and Couchbase for probably a whole hour. I've got a whole different session. Uh, maybe that'll be a future webinar, but uh, no, uh, Couchbase supports asset transactions. Uh, it's a, kind of a unique implementation of it in that it is, it is all client driven. Um, for the most part, uh, with the exception of the nickel uh, language, SQL language has a begin commit rollback that was just added. Uh, can Couchbase be deployed across multiple Azure clouds? It can be deployed across multiple clouds of any kind, really. Um, in fact, that's one of the great things about Couchbase is this thing called XDCR, cross data center replication. 
So you can have a cluster running in Azure East and Amazon West, for instance, and sync between those data centers if you want to. So um, to, I, I don't know if DataStax, how DataStax does that, but with Couchbase, you would deploy two different clusters across different data centers and sync between them. Uh, so then the question is, how is ACID employed? Um, if I think the Im implication is, how is it employed across multiple data centers? And the answer is it's not. That is extremely hard problem uh, to, to basically lock data centers across a, a planet, for instance. And we're, we're, not, we're not there yet. So you'd have ACID within one cluster, but not within the second cluster. Um, I should say not across both clusters. Matthew, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation, as always. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all our attendees who have been so incredible and uh, engaged in everything that we do. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation. Well, thank you, Matthew. Thanks to Couchbase for sponsoring today's webinar, and hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thanks, all.